Welcome. My name is Tracy Burrell. I'm the founder of Skillstat Learning, a emergency medical training company based in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. We've been around for more than 20 years. I've been teaching critical care, critical care skills for at least the last 30. And I want to today talk about something that is dear to my heart, which is what does it mean to do chest compressions, particularly in the setting of in-hospital? There's an infographic that we're referring to. It's called Chest Compression Step Up in Hospital. And you'll be able to download that you know, from the video uh, towards the end of the program. Today, you know, what we want to really talk about is just the value of what chest compressions can do in real life. In many of the advanced courses, whether it's advanced cardiovascular life support, pediatric advanced life support, even trauma care and others, CPR is a fundamental core base skill that if you don't do this when a person has a cardiac arrest, then all else pretty much doesn't matter. So if you don't get these fundamentals done and done well, then all the other what we would call advanced stuff right, has no impact. So these core fundamentals, which unfortunately in 2022 we call basic life support, and the reason I say it's unfortunate is because the word basic back in the day, 30 some years ago, really meant if you wanted to master something, you'd want to make sure you had the basics done because the basics were the fundamentals. Well, today the word basic means something different. It seems to mean more simple or easy or it's what the, you know, the non-advanced people do. And then the fancy people come in and we do other things. Well, we've been taught a lesson, particularly over the last 15 years, you know, on the advantage of doing chest compressions as well, and what it actually means to whether or not someone will come back after a cardiac arrest, you know, and hug you, you know, and thank them for, or thank you for, you know, making a difference in their lives, where they come back intact after a cardiac arrest. So today, I want to go over the unique aspect of chest compressions, particularly in the setting of in a hospital. Now, the history of chest compressions. It started chest compressions in the 60s. So in the, in the 1960s, CPR as a skill set was invented and began to be lived in hospital and pre before hospital in the paramedic setting. It actually began more in the paramedic settings. The paramedics were doing this, you know, at, in home and in ambulance and the like. Hospital picked it up towards the end of the 60s and has been doing it ever since. The courses around chest compressions generally have been wrapping in something called CPR. So we got cardiopulmonary resuscitation where it includes not just chest compressions, but also the use of an automated external defibrillator, uh, now also narcotics and other aspects as well, airway management. Chest compressions is central to doing CPR well. So we're in hospital, and let's say that, you know, you were in a medical floor, and what we have is a team that recognize someone who's arrested right in front of their eyes. All right? They've actually made phone calls already. They've tried to bring a hospital in, hospitalist in or a surgeon or someone like that. And this person is arrested. They've checked the pulse, no pulse, no signs of life. You know, or maybe the occasional dysfunctional gasp of breath, which is a sign of death. So they start and they'll begin chest compressions maybe, but at the very least what they're going to do is push a button or make a phone call to try to activate the advanced code team to arrive in hospital. Now on average the code team outside of the critical care areas take about five to about eight minutes to set up, get there set up and also get going and doing something important. So it takes about five to eight minutes on average in any hospital of size. So for the first five minutes, seven minutes, the people that found this person arrested are the people that are there with that person. Now, here's the thing. It's been there. It's been, it's been done where people would push a button and sometimes not know what to do next. It, it does happen in hospital. 
I, I've been there where I've gone gone to codes, you know, codes where people would call us from the ICU or, or CCU, the intensive care unit or cardiac care unit, or an eMERGE. And we get up there and, you know, essentially the person's arrested sitting up in the bed and, you know, people are like, it's about time you got there, right? Or by the time you got here. And, you know, it's like, well, you could have been, but we don't say anything. It's like, we're going to essentially get going. There's also times that I've got there where the CPR that was being done is being done poorly and someone is trying to do it from the side and the depth that they're going and all the different components of CPR are just not being performed very well. I would say that that happens at least half the time. And then there's times when they arrive where everything's in play. It's, you arrive and it's interesting because people have the bed down flat, they got a backboard under the patient, they're doing amazing CPR. They got stools on either side. All right, they're going for it, and with or without airway management, they're actually really trying to make sure that blood is flowing, and that blood is flowing while we're trying to get set up. I can't tell you the impact of when you arrive into a room where everything is actually moving, and CPR is going, because us as a team, we're humans, and us humans, we need hope. And when we arrive in a room and this is being done we feel hopeful and for good reason, like for some really good reason. Because what we find is when we get there and everything's going on and then you ask people, when did you find them? It says, well, they were just having shortness of breath or they were breathing really fast or they, they stopped responding, but they saw it happen and they started CPR right from the get go. And then we think about how long it took to get there, but they've been doing amazing CPR ever since. They've right from the beginning. And we arrive, we know a few things. Now, those are three different options of when you get to a room, you know, and if you're not doing any CPR at all, the person loses about 10% chance of coming back every single minute, all right? So 10%. If you're not doing anything at all, 10% per minute. So if we arrive for that story where someone would get there and, like, nothing's being done, well, then we're working, and it took us five minutes to get set up, best case, well, that's five times 10%. We lose about half the chance of bringing them back even before we show up. Right? So that's if nothing's being done. If we get there in kind of crappy CPR, not very effective CPR is being done, they lose about 7% per minute. So less than if you weren't doing anything. So it helps. But still, that means five minutes, 7% is about 35%. We arrive and we have about a two-thirds, 65% chance of bringing them back. But for that third story, where they're doing everything, everything is being done, it's like, we just love to come into that story. And people are doing great work. And it was right from the start. Well, the person that's arrested will only lose about 2% per minute. Which means that if we got it set up within five minutes, well, we're working from a 90% chance bringing them back. Now let me tell you, Everything changes when we come in and think it's going to be like a 90% chance of bringing it back. Right? Everybody does things better. This hope matters for us humans. So at the very least, the impact on the team is if you start CPR from the beginning, it impacts the team. But more importantly, it impacts the likelihood of this person coming back. And then, and then maybe later on coming back and giving you chocolates, if that's a thing. All right? so, so I want to let you know that you know, doing amazing CPR you know, it's some, here sometimes we call it kick butt CPR, you know, is, makes an enormous difference on the team, but also on the likelihood of this person coming back. Now, chest compressions itself, if you're taking most any course out there, you know, whether it's from American Heart or Heart and Stroke or the European Resuscitation Council or Red Cross or St. John's, all these different groups, Right? Almost every single place that are teaching CPR do not talk about what is unique about a hospital. They don't talk about the bed. Right? They figure that, you know, every one of the courses I've been to and taught, and taught to, if you look at the reading materials, it's like everybody's on the floor. Right? Well, that would be nice, right? Because I'll tell you, doing CPR on a person on the floor is way easier and better and more functional than doing it on the piece of furniture that we almost always do in a hospital, which is called a bed. So that would be nice to do the floor. And I know that most of the 
paramedics that find someone arrested on a bed in a home, the first thing they're going to do is take a person off the bed and put them on the floor because it's, you know it's just so much more effective. But in hospital, all of our equipment is at bed height. So I'll tell you what happens. You know, the paramedics, they take a person off the bed, put them on the floor. In the hospital, we find someone on the floor. We might start there, but soon enough, we're going to get them on a bed because everything's at the bed height. You know, so it's interesting how this seems kind of like not in the same world. So we have to deal with bed. So I'm not going to say, hey, take everybody off the bed and put them on the floor. Not in the hospital. It's not going to happen. So we have to go with what, what is real. And real is people arrest on beds in hospital. Sometimes they arrest in bathrooms. That's a thing too. Or on the floor somewhere. But most often it's on bed. And that's a unique challenge. The infographic itself has a whole section on what does it mean to work on a bed. It also has a whole section on what does it mean to team. Because when you're outside in the community, sometimes you might be just you. Maybe if you're lucky, you'll have a second person and they'll have gone to, hopefully gone to call for help and bring back an automated external defibrillator, an AED. In hospital, we almost always have a team. So we get there, we start, we see someone arrest. Let's say that's where it begins. And I want to get that point where it's only 2% per minute. You know, I know that CPR, contrary to every movie you've ever seen, right? CPR all by itself will not bring a person back. I'm sorry, folks. All right, so I let you know. All right, but it's not movie time. All right, real life. There's a reason that someone is actually arrested, and we have to fix that reason. That's one of the reasons we want to get a code card and a whole team there. But if you do amazing CPR, CPR is there with chest compressions alone will push blood to the brain, and when it does so, if you have all your ducks in a row, you'll get a to 25% of normal flow, which is one thing to know is 25% of normal flow of blood through the body is enough to save a person. Most often our blood flow in our body is way more than what we need. So if we get down to about a quarter of what you need, people, you could still save everything if you keep it going and you minimize interruptions to almost zero. So there is a theme here. Stay on, try to stay on, get it done, but try to keep that blood flowing. Now, we know that if you don't have blood flow to the brain in particular, that it just takes 180 seconds, less than you know, about three minutes before for brain cells to begin to die. The rest of the body can last a little longer without blood flow. The heart cells, for example, take about 30 minutes before they start to die. And if you're talking about fingers and toes and that, we're talking sometimes hours. But not any of us, I think, that are watching this or listening to this are going to be saying that I'm going to, I'd like to deal with, my heart's good, but I lost my brain. That was successful. All right? It's like, I want them all. And particularly, I, I don't mind losing a couple of toes if I can keep my brain, if I had to make the choice. So, so we think that this CPR, particularly the chest compression, is about trying to save the brain. And 25% will get it done. But in order to get 25%, there's a number of pieces that have to play. And then here's the thing about this. Every one of them are important. So you, you can't not deal with a certain piece. So I want to just go over these pieces. Now we know that in any class that you're going to do around chest compressions, that there's three components you want to make sure that gets done. You want to make sure you're going deep enough into the chest. You want to make sure you're going fast enough and not too fast. And you want to make sure you're coming up every single time. All right, complete. So it's like, don't seem that complicated. All right, I'm going to go deep enough. I'm going to go fast enough. I'm going to come up every single time. All right, so if, if you don't know anything about chest compression, just know that those are the three components. And as to how deep you're going, we want to go at least two inches or five centimeters. But again, that's in an adult, all right, an adult, any, and we're all different sizes, but we want to try to shoot for at least two inches, five centimeters. Now, the reason you want to deal with that, most of the evidence will tell you that if you only go four centimeters instead of five, you'll get half the survivability. 
that last centimeter matters. In fact, it matters quite a bit. In 2022, we've started encouraging it not to go for five centimeters or two inches, but to go for a bit more. All right, shoot for six centimeters. Shoot for two and a half centimeters or two and a half inches. Six centimeters, two and a half inches. Shoot for that. Think about the last time you did a quiz or a test. Did you shoot for 51%? 10 to 1, that wasn't it. All right. So when you think a person's life's in the balance, you think we should go with minimal viable? Or you think we should go with something that's going to be give us a little bit of, you know, buffer? And also shoot for six centimeters, shoot for two and a half inches. And here's one thing. When you're doing CPR, you will not know how deep you're going. I'll tell you right now. All right. You'll be on top of you're pushing into someone's sternum, generally in the lower half of the sternum, right in the middle. That's where you're going to be shooting for. But when you're doing it, you will not know how deep you're going. And when you bring back to four centimeters, less than two inches, it could cut the survivability in half. You know you want to go deep enough. One of the best ways to do it in 2022 is to have a partner there with you, looking at you and making sure and giving, make, giving you feedback from the side. Because from the side, you can, you can tell how deep someone's going. Now, have you ever thought about what's, what does two inches, two and a half inches look like? Do you have anything around you that may actually be about two and a half inches wide or six centimeters wide? Do you have anything? Think about it, like something you carry with you all the time. Well, sometimes people would say, that's like the width of my phone. That's right. It's about the width of your phone. Most phones are going to give you actually about that. If you're talking that width, and most people have their phones with them now, take that phone out and make sure, yeah, it's like you may even want to measure that phone, but shoot for the width of the phone. I know some of them are bigger than others, but that will still get you in a good zone. The other option, which I like, which seems to be another thing we carry around with us, we carry around a debit card or a credit card. Maybe a business card if you're old school. Every one of those are at least five centimeters. So to try to go deeper, just a little bit deeper than that into adults. That's practical. And get somebody to coach you. Give you feedback. Make sure you're going at least and try to shoot for six centimeters, two and a half inches. That makes a difference. The rate? Well, you know, we, we've heard that Staying Alive is a song out there. And it was put out by the Bee Gees in 1982. And I bet you 10 to 1, most people watching this weren't even around 1982. So, but it seems to be a song that people still sing. It's not wrong to do so. But think about this. Think about if you're going to do CPR, can you just put the word and in between each one that you do? So think of like one and two and three and four and five, and maybe start with one again and just keep going. And if you can put the word and in between, what you're going to get is a rate of close to 110. One and two and three and four and five, and then you'd be in the good zone. If you go less than 100 beats per minute, you're not going to produce the same blood flow, and that 25% is going to be is going to suffer. If you go over 120, same thing seem to happen, right? The blood flow suffers. So now we're talking. Not only do you want to go deep enough, you want to be in a zone, you know, and shoot for 110. This is not range time. We're trying to do a peak performance, like. I have a target I want to go after. 110 would be great. Some people, if they're, you have a coach there helping you, can actually open up their phone and put a metronome on if they want, right at 110. Not that hard, right? But in the end, if all you do is one and two and three, and the key is that you go deep enough. If you go faster than 120, you know what suffers most? Well, if you're playing a game called Family Feud, the best, most popular answer would be, Recoil, don't have enough time for the heart to collect blood. So going too fast, we need the heart to collect blood. But what most of the evidence shows, that if you go too fast, depth suffers most. All right, you don't have the time to go deep enough. So when I really focus on one ten per minute, all right, one ten per minute, one and two and three and four and five. Think about that. If there's other songs out there, there's lots of songs. If you internet, you got to search it and go CPR songs. You'll actually come up, there'll be a whole list. You can, maybe you'll see something, and I'm going to beaver it. You know, you can do whatever you want, but you're going to want to find a song that works for you. Okay? So, one ten per minute. And then the last thing has to do with, do we need, we need to come all the way up every single time. Now, we talked about the importance of the last centimeter or half an inch down. 
twice its survivability. Now the last centimeter or three quarters of a centimeter, about a third of an inch up, that last little bit up is where 85% of the blood comes through in that last little bit. So if you come all the way up, but not all the way up, you're doing almost nothing. Are you doing almost nothing? It's not a small thing. So if you're going to do this, you're going to do it well. You got to come up all the way. So again, the person that be watching you could be coaching you and making sure that you're going deep enough. You're going to shoot for six centimeters, two and a half inches, going for about one ten per minute, one and two and three and four and five, and then coming all the way up every single time. You do those three things. That's just that three things, and you do it from the get go when someone arrests. 2% per minute is all you're going to lose. The most important person in the room is a person doing chest compressions. Next to that is a person coaching you. Oh, and it's going to be tiring. I'll tell you right now. All right. I've done lots and lots of CPR when I was younger. You know, even when I was younger, I was the incredible melting person because I'd be sweating everywhere after a very short period of time. You're going to find that the most you're going to want to do is two minutes. And if you have a partner there with you, you can give them a hairy eyeball, all right, and sort of give them the idea that, or her the idea that, come on in, right, or they the idea, that, come on in, right, and help me out. And it might be 45 seconds later, all right, but do what you can, right, to just back and forth seamlessly. And if they're great right with you and you have everything you needed, including two stools perhaps, one on either side of the bed, you give a hairy eyeball to the other person 40 seconds later, you don't have to stop CPR because that person can climb on the other stool right in front facing you, put their hands on yours. And then as soon as you pull away, they're starting to do it like a seamless CPR. There is no interruption. This is a thing. So if you're doing chest compressions on the floor, great. One person either side of the person. You're on a bed, well, you got to do things different, right? So in order to get those three things done, on a bed. So I want to transition into the bed. Right? What you need, we need to get into is to factor this mattress as a problem. I ask people, you know, is there like a worse place to do chest compressions? Go deep enough, all the way up, all right, and, you know, fast enough than a bed. Is there a worse place? I've got some really great answers at times. You know, most people say, no, there is like, it's the worst place. And I totally agree, it's the worst place. And then some people say, Hammock, okay, that'd be a worse place. All right, hammock's the worst place. Or maybe uh, one person said International Space Station. Okay, I could see that be a trouble. All right, or one person said a waterbed, which they're a little older. You know, even knew what a waterbed was. All right, so there's there's worse places. You can't do CPR when the person in the lake. All right, you got to get them out of the lake. You got to be on a firm surface, one way or another. A bed is not a firm surface. It is a soft, wide high, you know, and sometimes it's angled because we're on a hospital bed. All those have to be dealt with in order to get this and to do it well. The infographic talks about the key components to how do you make a bed work for you during chest compressions. Well, one of the first things you got, we have to do, I think, is we got to get that bed and bring it down low and flat. And in fact, when I'm teaching this, I usually take low est as in not just lower, about as low as you can get, get it down. All right, you say, well, but what about the airway person? Well, hell, here's the thing. For adults, it's rarely about the airway person. It's all about getting that blood flow. We have a lot of oxygen on board, sometimes for several minutes, if you keep it flowing, right? And that has to do with chest compressions. So about the bed, get it down and get it flat. Just even a five degree elevation, one study showed 70% less blood flow. Got to get it flat. So even if there's just a simple pillow under the head, take it out. All right, get that person flat. Make that mattress firm. How are you going to do that? Well, some mattresses just push a button, they, it firms right up. There's a CPR button. Nice. Most people aren't using that, so we're going to use a backboard. And that backboard is designed to make a person wider. All right, so that you have to push against more mattress because the board is wider than the person. When you do that, you have to push against more mattress, not as much mattress goes down. If you have a person that's smaller and they don't have a backboard, you're gonna find they sink right into the mattress. 
right? And then your compression, which might feel like you're going deep enough, almost all what's going on is you're pushing and the mattress goes down by this far and the sternum goes down by this far, which is like, if you're watching, if you're listening to this, it's like it might be like two thirds of the depth is the mattress and one third of the depth is the sternum. That's not what we're trying to set up for. You need a backboard. And the backboard needs to go under there. And then when the person's wider with the backboard, great. And you're going to find that chest compressions are easier. Why? Well, because when you push a mattress and a sternum, it takes effort to do both. You add those efforts up and you get, you know, t sometimes twice the effort to try to get the sternum down because you're pushing the mattress down too. You'll find, you will find that when you put the backboard under, it is much easier to do CPR and do it effectively. So backboard is there. Bed is low. Bed is flat. Great. All right. The next step you want is going to be thinking about stools. Unless you, everybody that you work with is six foot, you know, six foot seven. You know, if you feel that that's who everybody you're working with, uh, congratulations, by the way, very unique group. But in most cases, if people aren't averaging six foot seven, you're going to need stools on either side. We've tried people with six foot seven doing CPR, you know, and trying to get their shoulders right over top of the sternum and locking those elbows and trying to go deep enough. And I'll tell you what happens at six foot seven. They're up on their toes. And I don't know if you know many people that are six foot seven, but they haven't done a lot of ballet in their world usually. So don't expect them to be up on their toes very long. If they come off their toes, what they do is they lean on the patient. If they lean on the patient, then you're not getting recoil, and then we just negated almost all our efforts. You need stools. You need them on both sides. You need a bed flat. You need a backboard there. You need to firm that mattress. And the last thing, just for good measure, wouldn't be a bad idea to unlock briefly and pull that bed out from the wall so that airway person, and we're not completely ignoring them, but they have a place to be, right, right at the head of the bed. So pull it out from the wall, then lock that bed again. And I, can tell you many times it's like we forgot to lock the bed and accidents happen so lock that bed so the bed matters the depth matters the rate matters coming all the way up matters all this matters and then as we mentioned you need a coach you do not know how deep or how fast or even sometimes whether or not you're coming all the way up you need a coach there now if you have all those and you have all three Things change. So I just want to finish up with a, a little story of a hospital uh, in the U.S. I'm not going to mention which one, but their survivability discharge for cardiac arrest was less than the national average. But they were a very highly esteemed private hospital. And when they found that they were less than the national average, which include everybody, they're not happy about that. Of course they weren't. All right. And, you know, very soon after, the whole team met, including the resuscitation met, team met. It's like, what can we do about this? Now, they looked at everything. They looked at what does it take in a cardiac arrest for someone to come back. And they, of course, started with all the fancy stuff. And they started with, well, the best thing we could do probably is to keep them from arresting at all. Completely true. All right. If we could do everything to keep someone from arresting in the first place, that, by far, would say this, what we're talking about today, would not be needed, and that person would be probably leaving the hospital in a good way. So prevent. Prevent arrest. Do everything you can to prevent arrest. Step number two they're looking at was like, well, what do we do after the arrest? Is there stuff? Because when someone comes back from an arrest, they're usually in trouble for a while. It's, it's, a, it's a tentative, tentative and tenuous spot. Expect them to perhaps arrest again if we haven't fixed what's caused all this. And expect their blood pressure and their hemodynamics to be all over the place for at least a day or two. So the ICU is important. But this hospital will look at what they have for ICU and support and the people that are there. And, the, and it's like, you know what, we're actually some of the best in the world are right here. Post-arrest, we do everything. In fact, we do everything. We do it well. It's not our problem. During the arrest, the last thing we looked at, it's like, what do we do around the arrest itself? Is there something around the arrest that can make the numbers and make them better? Now, their survivability discharge back in the day, you know, when they were comparing, which is 2010, 
was 18%. The national average is 20. And they find that, yes, indeed, they, they, they prevent and they do really good work around trying to deal with a problem and doing it quick, which you identify it. After the arrest is over, they do everything they can to try to support the person so they can recover. But when they look at the arrest itself, fixing the problem of the arrest, for example, the person's in ventricular fibrillation, which is a quivering of the heart going at rates of close to four to 700 per minute. No time for the ventricles to actually collect blood or even or with the quivering to pump it out. It's interesting to know that when someone goes into that rhythm, they usually lose consciousness within three to five seconds. Usually not enough time to alert someone that something's going on. But when CPR is started and the team arrives, they're gonna find that the team to try to treat the problem. And the problem here is ventricular fibrillation at four to 700 beats per minute. And what they'll do is they'll put pads that sandwich the heart and then they'll charge up and they'll clear everybody because nobody else wants this energy. So going to give it into the right person. And then we're going to try to stop the heart from doing the 400 to 700, which is what a successful shock called defibrillation is. Now, that is one cause of a cardiac arrest. There are many. But they looked at all of their causes and, you know, they went through them all and went, you know, we're good at all this. In fact, we're great at all this. And that's actually true of most hospitals have been around the world. We're good at treating causes. All right, really good. And there's not actually much to separate hospitals when it comes to that. There's not much to separate hospitals in preventing arrest either. And there's not that much separating hospitals when it comes to what do we do after the person comes back. But this group looked at what do they do during the arrest that wasn't about fixing the problem. It was about what did they do during the rest that was about saving the brain and saving the person. So they were intact after we fixed the problem, otherwise known as CPR. And when they looked at that, they were troubled, right? They were troubled because what they were doing seemed to be a little lopsided, a little off balance, focused way more on treatment and not enough on trying to save a person so that after we treated them, that the person was there afterwards intact. So they started to focus on that. Now, this is not new. Back in the 2003, 2005, we also found that evidence in the hospital showed that we were not doing CPR very well. We were focused a little bit too much on treatment and not enough on trying to save. 2010, this hospital looked at this and then decided to put everything in play to continue to do what they're doing well, but also to try to focus on, let's see if we can save that brain and stay on the chest. They measured how much they're going into a chest with a set of pads that measures depth. All right. It has something called an accelerometer and measures depth. So they did that. They knew that even with the backboard, that mattress can still sink about a centimeter and a half or almost a half an inch. So when they did the feedback, they're trying to shoot for six and a half centimeters, not five, all right, six and a half, to be able to deal with the amount that the backboard and the mattress sinks anyways. So they shoot for six and a half. They changed the way they approached these cardiac arrests, including some of the maneuvers that they were doing regularly that have been proven to be not beneficial during the rest, they stopped doing them. They did this in order to maximize time on chest and not get enamored, essentially enamored with doing things like putting a tube in a person's throat, intubation, or starting central lines, or doing anything that actually wasn't gonna make an, the change, a positive change to success. So they stopped doing that stuff. Now, they didn't stop completely because there's times where you've got to do that stuff. If the person is airways getting narrower and we, it's time we got to get this tube in now to protect their airway, then it now is now. We don't wait until after the code's over. So there's definitely unique situations where we might have to do that. But their focus is on completely changing and we're going to treat what we need to and we're going to save the brain when we're doing it. What they found was that within a couple of years, three years actually, they made sure a few things happened. First, everybody in the building, everybody, I mean the accountants, everybody, 
were doing CPR every year. So that didn't matter where things happened in the hospital, not only the patients that were admitted, but anybody else that were walking around would be protected and people would start what they should be starting right from the get-go. So that was being done. They were doing mock simulations with not only the people that were doing that are on the medical floor that may not have to be managing the advanced team, they'll be doing it once every six months mocks, but people that are on the code team were doing it generally every month to three months, regular sims that practiced at it. They also identify what's most important. They prioritized. And their priority was treat problems as soon as you can. Big deal. But also, do everything you can to give uninterrupted blood flow with effective kick butt CPR. So they focused on that. And what happened over the two years is they were measuring it. And they were essentially debriefing about it. And if people had put... If someone put it intubated, like intubated where it was done needlessly, that person was called out, right? And the team was called out. So continue to move better and get better. Well, by 2014, they measured a whole year of cardiac arrests. And when they did a whole year of cardiac arrests, they found that, that well, they got game. The whole hospital had the culture had changed. That it wasn't just about treating problems, it was about saving brain. And it was measurable. And the depth of compressions they were doing on average for a year of codes, not only in the critical care, but medical, surgical, everywhere, the average depth of compression was 6.7 centimeters. And the thing was, is okay, so, so what? What happened? Well, it's interesting, nothing fancy changed. It was all the core basics of chest compressions that changed. The amount of time off chest per minute was reduced to 2.54 seconds. I'll remember that because I, I've shared this regularly. But two and a half seconds per minute, that means that 57.5 seconds, almost the whole minute, they're on the chest. Blood flow is happening. In order to achieve that, my goodness, they had game. They still do. All right, so 2.54 seconds off the chest per minute. That's their average whole year. Survivability discharge, 18% was where it was before they started all this. They changed it 54%. They tripled their numbers without doing anything changes in fancy. No new drugs, no new anything else. Just focus on really what we should be doing. Right? And now they have things in balance. Say brain treat problem. 54% translates into 88 more people leaving the hospital alive than when they weren't doing this. I know, by the way, neurological integrity, if you're thinking this is a thing, that people don't leave intact, 94% of the people left where they can go home independent. That's a big deal. This is one hospital doing, well, great work. And it was a whole hospital. Everybody had to be involved. Not only people leading these codes, but everybody else involved in these and from the people on med surge from the get-go, doing kick-butt CPR from the beginning until the co-team got there. That this all was important. Survivability discharge in a hospital has increased now, you know, for the last 15 years from 13% in 2003, which by the way, 13% in 2003 was the same as in hospital cardiac arrest survivability in 1957. So, 1957 was before CPR, by the way. So, 2003 was, it was a pretty dark year, at least for the resuscitationists. I just think often, you know, I was around then, and I was like practicing then, and I saw this, and I went, what are we doing? It's like, is CPR even important? Because it looks like it's not. The survivability is no different. 1957 was before CPR. And what they found is they started to study for the first time in a hospital, multiple centers. The evidence to date, we're just trusting what was going on pre-hospital with the paramedics. They were doing great work. In fact, their numbers were just getting better and better, partly because of the quality of CPR that they were doing and the blood flow they were doing, but also because of the AEDs that they were bringing with them and the fact that people were starting to do it at home 
and start CPR at home. This was happening. And then the paramedics would show up and it's like things were happening. And of course they had hope, but they're also more importantly, brain was being, you know, sexually kept alive by the efforts of people at home. In hospital, we figured, you know, it's just going to be naturally better. And we just, we're good. We're qualified professionals. And what happened was when we found that their survivability wasn't changing at all, it was like back to the drawing board. I started looking at CPR even matter and studies started, you know, multi-center trials started, you know, again, looking at. And in 2005, you know, the, the new release from ILCOR and then AHA and Heart and Stroke and other groups, you know, the European groups and the Asian groups and the Australia and New Zealand groups all said CPR important. So like I had to call it out as, you know, CPR. In 2010, the standards changed again, but they found that the performance in hospital really hadn't changed much. Just by calling it out, didn't seem to make that much of a difference, but it made some difference. Survivability discharge for the first time increased by 50% and went from 13% to 20% in five years, no difference in almost 50. So it looks like we're making a difference, but the studies on the quality of CPR with the hospitals that were in these databases such as get with the guidelines groups we're showing we're still not where we need to be we're getting better but we're not where we need to be so in 2010 they changed cpr to what quality cpr all right so that was a new term quality cpr so it's like we got to do something called difference quality cpr 2015 it came out again another standards you know change 2015 Look, yeah, we're getting better. We're now surviving up to 26%, but if you look at the studies of chest compressions and like in hospital, still not doing good, all right? In fact, there still hasn't been a study to date, multiple centers, where we're showing we're going deep enough better than half the time. We haven't hit 50 yet. We're still doing enough, or at least a letter mark, all right? So in 2015, they called it now high-quality CPR. Right. You see a bit of a trend here? All right. So when I say kick butt, I'll tell you when I'm in classes, I don't say butt. I say something else. I can do anything I can to actually call out this something as being CPR is tough to do completely well, but so vital if we're going to make a difference on survivability discharge. I teach advanced stuff. But you can't do the advanced stuff unless you have these fundamentals in play. Chest compressions matter. The evidence is overwhelming. The mechanisms to do it well out of hospital are simple. I'm going to go deep enough, I'm going to go fast enough, and I'm going to come up all this every time. And you know what? It's not hard to do on some news on the floor. And keep doing it. And get help, because your CPR is going to save a brain, but it's not there to treat the problem. In hospital, we have the bed. And you, we got to factor that in. And we also have to factor in all these talented people that want to do their talented stuff. All right? We have to factor that in. And we have to have discipline. You know, and look at some of the leadership. That group, by the way, that was less than the national average in the U.S. is now called a sentinel. Right, sight. Sentinel being, they're the ones to emulate, and they are. The good news is that you don't need your whole hospital to do this. You just need, if you're in this story yourself, you just need to lead it so that this gets done. And if there's time that someone wants to interrupt, you give them a bit of a hairy eyeball, like, do we really need to? You know, and they go, okay, maybe we don't. Or maybe it's like, but we need the shock and get this ventricular fibrillation satisfied and out of that okay maybe we need to but i'm going to do everything i can to do cpr right up until the moment of shocking and then back in right after you finish to maximize time because i don't know about you but if someone came in all right someone came in that we knew we worked on and then they went to the icu and we saw them and worked them there and then three four days later they started to wake up and then you see the family come in and meet with them and just see how important and the impact that this person has in other people's lives. And then 
Weeks later, you come, they come back, they walk in. You don't recognize them because they're not a patient anymore. They're a person that's in the community with you. And they come in with a grandson. And that four-year-old looks up at you and says, thank you for saving my opa. Oh, yeah, and there's a box of chocolates there. Ten to one, this is going to float your boat for probably a year or two. So during a cardiac arrest, what we do when this is happening matters. We can't do it by ourselves. We can start on our own, but in hospital, on a bed, coming back to two stools, a CPR coach, going deep enough, going fast enough, coming all the way up every time, can make all the difference, particularly if we can keep it going. All right, so while we're trying to treat a problem, big deal, we also want to try to save a brain. Now, what to do now? Well, first thing, you know, we talked about how some groups will give you a 54% survivability discharge and others give you eight. Now we're talking about hospitals, you know, and big numbers and lots of arrests over a year, and these numbers mean that. But what about us? You know, what about you? And what can you achieve? Well, each code that you're at, you know, you're at it there and you happen that CPR is needed. Well, then what you do and how you share some of this expertise with your colleagues are going to make all the difference in the world. Right? You can actually, your codes, I don't know what's going on, but whenever you're at a cardiac arrest, things seem to turn out pretty well. And you may want to share why. And part of it is going to be your, you know, the criteria around how to do chest compressions well. Part of it will be the discipline to ensure that people continue to go back and forth so they don't get too tired. Part of it is going to be how you look up and give maybe a hairy eyeball, you know, to the person that wants to do something to interrupt that doesn't really have much impact on treatment. All of these add up. I encourage you to share this if you feel that it was worthwhile with your colleagues and friends. Again, it takes more than one, right? We need a team. I encourage you to, if you can, send us some feedback. You know, what you thought about this. Maybe, you know, how we can improve this. You know, have you thought about? You know, please give us a, just give us a dingle that way. All right? And if you want to share it, you know, on social media and the like, of course, we always, you know, appreciate that because that's how the message gets out. Thank you for taking the time, your precious time, to watch this video. And keep an eye open for some of the other videos that are coming your way.